guys and welcome back to our podcast Mets and More. This week we will be talking about epilepsy and here I have three speakers with me who are going to share their experience as well as their knowledge on epilepsy. So maybe we can start with a little bit of introduction from our speaker here today. Let's start with Dr. Erica. Hi, I'm Dr. Erica, medical expert on the topic of epilepsy from UMNC. So hi, my name is Farzin. Uh, I have a family member with epilepsy and I've been taking care of her since seven years now. So I'm here to share my experience in handling epilepsy patients. Hi, I'm Dr. Abisha. I'm also a medical expert on the topic of epilepsy from UMNC. Okay guys, so the reason that we chose epilepsy as our topic of discussion for today's podcast is because there's been a viral video that's been going around about a small child who's experiencing epilepsy. No. So maybe to kick things off, um, Dr. Erika and Dr. Alicia, can you provide our listeners with a comprehensive overview of what is epilepsy and how does it occur and what are the main types of seizures associated with it? Epilepsy is a brain related neurological condition characterized by current unconsciousness that may affect the entire body or just part of the body. Occasionally, control of power of learning function and loss of consciousness occurs. A seizure usually happens when the normal electrical brain function is disrupted momentarily and sparks of the brain and experience a burst of abnormal electrical signal. Seizures may also vary. The two main types of epileptic seizures are generalized, such as absence, atonic, tonic-tonic, and mind-tonic seizures, as well as partial, like simple and complex seizures. Therefore, there are many possible causes of epilepsy, such as severe head injury, uh, brain infections, brain tumor, stroke, head trauma, alcoholism or alcohol withdrawal, heart attack, and so on. So, cerebral palsy, autism spectrum disorder, and intellectual disabilities may be associated with epilepsy. And also, epilepsy may have no male physiology in the majority of cases. Okay, thank you for that um, explanation of the Erica. Dr. Alicia, how can epilepsy be diagnosed? Okay, so epilepsy can be diagnosed for its treatment purposes. So for what I mean by that is that epilepsy can be diagnosed through medical history, manifestation of signs and symptoms, patient's medical history and also past medical history. Aside from that, epilepsy can also be diagnosed through imaging techniques and scanning techniques. For example, Imagine technique called electrodes for the drugs can be used to measure the patient's brain weight to detect any kind of anomalies. So another example is a spectrum scanner. scanner. The spectrum scanner can be used to detect the focal seizures of the brain by injecting a blood flow tracer within 30 seconds of the seizure. And lastly, epilepsy can also be diagnosed through blood tests, neurological, behavior, and also development. Thank you for the detailed introduction of the Erika and Dr. Elisa. I think we can dive deeper into the pharmacological treatments that are available for epilepsy. I think listeners would like to know like, what are the anti-epileptic drugs that we have in the market. And maybe Dr. Erika and Dr. Elisa can share what are the side effects and what are the contraindications that are related to these drugs. So that's Amigaproexin, which is one of the most common anti-epileptic drugs that we use to treat various types of seizures. Rubber acid works by increasing the amount of inhibitory neuroplasticity called GABA. The inhibitory neuroplasticity has a common effect in the brain and prevents the excessive basis of electrical activity, which causes the seizures. The rubber acid do this by either boosting the production of GABA or preventing its breakdown. However, rubber acid can cause effects such as upset stomach, weight gain, and non-prescript effects. So that's why it is important to monitor the breakdown of the patient by indicating rubber acid. Lastly, vulgar acid can also cause birth defects before it is contraindicated to the given in pregnant women. Another key anti epileptic drug used is carbamazepine, which works by local sodium ion channels and prevents the electrical signal from firing out of control and causing seizures. Some of the common side effects of this medication is dizziness and nausea. 
So carbon monoxide is not suitable for patients with allergy to the medication, a bone marrow problem, or asthma symptoms, which causes great periods of scaring or blinking. Next, let's talk about Levitral syndrome, which works in a unique way. It binds itself to a specific protein in the brain called synaptic polyvector, SP2A, that plays a role in releasing chemicals between brain cells. Therefore, Levitral syndrome helps to regulate those chemical signals and prevent seizures. Sleepiness, dizziness, and fatigue are some of the signs that need to be aware of with Levitral syndrome. Now I'm going to share about type 1, which is one of the oldest anti-epileptic drugs that we have. Similarly to carbon residue, Amitron works by binding and blocking a protein called voltage matrix for each other. And this voltage will allow fewer sodium flux, which will reduce the generation of extra potential that causes seizures. Side effects of Amitron can occur at any doses or may only occur at high doses. So it's only for any movement, which we know as ataxia, involuntary eye movement, known as Liver toxicity and also drug attachments. It's also important to note that due to its various drug interactions and also serious side effects, constant therapeutic drug monitoring is required when undertaking any drug. And lastly, similar to laboratory acid, any drug is also contraindicated in pregnancy. So lastly, I'm going to share about lemon treating, which has a dual action by blocking both sodium channels and also character channels. This will prevent the influx or entering of calcium and sodium into the brain cells. Thus, it will reduce the release of excitatory neurotransmitters such as aspartate and also glutamate. Neurotransmitters can cause nausea, vomiting, and also rashes, but the most serious side effect is called Levin Johnson syndrome, which is a skin condition. Therefore, it is contraindicated to intubate neurotransmitters for patients with hypersensitivity. Okay, thank you, Dr. Alisa and Dr. Erika, for that comprehensive overview of pharmacological treatments that we have available for epilepsy. So now, research has shown that non-pharmacological approaches are also important in managing epilepsy. How do these treatments work and what evidence do we have to support their effectiveness? I think we can start with Dr. Elisa. Yes, some non-pharmacological treatments have been proven to be effective in treating epilepsy alongside with other medications. So one of the examples is a procedure called neural feedback therapy by monitoring the patient's electrode program or brain wave. Neural feedback therapy is a very safe and non-invasive procedure which helps to train the brains of the patients to reduce the seizures activity. During this procedure, multiple sensors will be placed on the patient's clock to monitor the brain waves which are electrical signals. Then these information will then be compared to a database of a healthy brain wave method and help the medical experts to identify areas of the brain that might be overactive, underactive or not functioning properly. So this will help us to understand the potential cause of the surgery. So we will that there is a method called operant conditioning where the goal is to encourage the brain to produce a specific brain wave frequencies. So with new feedback, we can see how certain effects in the brain wave will affect the brain wave factors and this brain wave feedback will help us to adjust the brain activity to a healthier state. So over time with these sessions, the brain can maintain a more balanced electrical pattern and helps to reduce the frequency and severity of surgery. There is also studies that show that a ketogenic diet would help to manage epilepsy. Normally, our brain will get its energy from glucose, then transported in the vessel, we will get the glucose across the barrier and into the brain cells. The glucose metabolism produces the rapidly available energy that is necessary uh, for the seizure activity. In a ketogenic diet, um, the blood glucose levels are low, and our brain will start to use the ketones produced from the breakdown of fat for energy. Its anaerobic metabolism reduce the energy availability, thus reducing seizures. In fact, studies have shown that the anti-pharmacy effect of epidemic diet can be put in the use of the glucose institution. Another study also proved that uh, the epidemic diet might increase the levels of alcohol, also known as the neurotransmitter, thus reducing seizures. Now, although this non-pharmacy treatment is proven to be effective, it is important to understand that it is not a replacement for drug therapy. Managing epilepsy involves more than just controlling seizures. Fazi, can you share your thoughts on the importance of learning about epilepsy and the different treatment options available? And how has this understanding of this condition and knowing how to manage it helped you and your family cope better? Okay. So, as someone has a family member with epilepsy, learning about the disease is important to manage the condition effectively. So, it has not only improved the physical management of seizures, but also enhanced our ability to provide emotional and psychological support. So firstly, with complete and accurate information regarding epilepsy, we can manage our family members' fear and anxiety that comes from having the disease. So for example, my family can be 
the uh, personalized content such as uh, identify specific victims of the MDMP and implement uh, strategies to avoid them. So other than that, we also uh, learn about first aid and safety measures, so it helps us in managing the seizures and research to prevent injuries better. So secondly, being well informed allows us to have a more effective conversation with our healthcare providers and helps us in asking the right questions and understanding the reasons behind each different treatment option. So for example, our doctors have advised my family that people taking anti epilepsy drugs uh, may have possible changes in more suicidal thoughts and also other changes. So my family is aware of the risk of the suicidal thoughts associated with the seizure medication. Hence, in, uh, we need to report it to our doctor if it happens so that our doctors can change to a uh, better medication. Lastly, patient education can also improve staff management behaviors in the medication. So in order to effectively manage chronic conditions on their own and avoid unfavorable substance consequences, Individuals with epilepsy require information and education about their illness. So, examples of behavioral adjustments is uh, medication experience, anxiety, good nutrition, and also stress reduction. So, these adaptive behavior and activities will promote seizure control and improve quality of life. So, therefore, understanding the condition has improved our ability to cope better with the challenges posed by epilepsy and leading to a more stable and supportive environment for our loved ones. Speaking to the treatment plan is a really important for managing epilepsy effectively. What has helped your family and your family to stay on track with the medications as well as other treatments? And are there any specific tools or techniques that have been particularly helpful to make sure everything is followed? Right. I think this would be a very good advice to our business out there who also have family members going through the same thing. Yes, for my family, we did have uh, several strategies that have helped us to stay on track. Firstly, we use uh, medication or analysis or two boxes to store the system for the week. So, additionally, we also uh, use a mobile application called Medicine Clear Reminder, which can be downloaded in the last box, which uh, helps in sending reminders and edits for each week. And so, this technology advances has, has helped us improve the medication experience and also management. So, we also use uh, Google Reminders, such as notes or charts, uh, in frequently in the house, such as on the page, so that uh, we can keep the treatment plan top of our mind. We also uh, keep regular appointments with our doctor to help us stay informed and make any necessary adjustments on medication and treatment plan. So this also provides an opportunity to discuss any concerns or side effects with the doctor. So for example, if uh, the patient has any side effects that is untolerable, we may share their concern with the doctor and so that the doctor will um, may add another medication to control the side effect, or maybe they can change to a better medication. Okay, so lastly, we also make sure to involve all family members in the treatment process to create a supportive environment. So by doing this, we can remind each other about the medication plans and provide encouragement to stay on track. So open communication within the family ensures everyone is aware of the treatment process and can assist if any issues arise. So supportive environment is very crucial to epilepsy patients and it may help to improve their mental health and boost experience and also may help uh, patients in dealing with them. So all in all, using these tools and techniques has been helping my family to stay on track with the treatment plan, ensuring better management of epilepsy and also overall Okay, I think that is all the questions I have for our speakers today. Thank you to Dr. Erica, Ms. Fazlin, as well as Dr. Alisa for coming on our podcast today, Meds and More, to speak about their knowledge as well as their experience on managing epilepsy. So I think that is it. We'll see you guys next week for the next episode. Thank you.